Hi, I am Don Blackwell, and I am the director of the Gospel Broadcasting Network. Welcome to this episode of Truth on Wheels. I have as a guest today, Brother Mike Hickson, and uh, Mike is a regular on GBN. Mike and I have done a lot of projects together over the years, yeah. and uh, Mike is about to launch a new program, Mike Hickson Live, and that's going to start in about a week. Uh, Correct. You a week from him, uh, yesterday. A week from start, yesterday. The ninth. And uh, we're going to be talking about just current issues, hot topics, and we hope and pray that we can get a lot of interest generated. And it might be that those who are watching today or watching the program today, that you have questions or things you'd like for us to discuss, we'd love to take those on. And the issue that we're actually going to be talking about in this episode of Truth on Wheels, I thought of Mike because this is a sort of thing that he will be dealing with on his program. I want to talk about something that took place earlier this week, March the 29th, 2024, which would have been designated as Easter Sunday. Mm -hmm. This was a proclamation on Transgender Day of Visibility, and the President of the United States made an announcement that shocked me. In Absolutely. Fact, when I first heard it, I thought it was a joke. I, I just could not believe that this could be true. I want to read part of it, and then uh, I want to get your thoughts about this. Sure. This is from uh, whitehouse.gov. On Transgender Day of Visibility, we honor the extraordinary courage and contributions of transgender Americans and reaffirm our nation's commitment to forming a more perfect union where all people are created equal and treated equally throughout their lives. I am proud that my administration has stood for justice from the start, working to ensure that the LGBTQI plus, that just gets longer and longer. Wow. He says that that, communi that community can live openly in safety with dignity and respect. I am proud to have signed the Respect for Marriage Act into law, ensuring that every American can marry the person they love. But then skipping ahead, he says, but extremists are proposing hundreds of hateful laws that target and terrify transgender kids and their families, silencing teachers, banning books, and even threatening parents, doctors, and nurses with prison for helping parents get care for their children. And it goes on and on. And uh, at the very end, he says, today we send a message to all transgender Americans. You are loved. You are heard. You are understood. You belong. You are America. And my entire administration and I have your back. Interesting, to say the least. Yeah. You know, Don, uh, there are so many things that could be said about this proclamation. I, I think first and foremost, and you and I, we've talked about this. You know, we believe in equality, uh, loving each other. Uh, in no way would we ever try to diminish the sanctity of human life, uh, a human being. Right. We've all been made in the image and the likeness of God based on Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And, and although we oppose the lifestyle, we still love the people. And I, I think that what we're really talking about to some extent here, uh, I mean, there, there are some moral issues at stake. I, I think that there could be, uh, you know, any number of, of other problems associated with it. But, you know, John said in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And in my mind, I know that as New Testament Christians, in no way do we endorse Easter as a religious holiday. Right. We meet every first day of the week. We observe the Lord's Supper, the death of Jesus. Uh, we don't observe Christmas as a religious holiday, nor do we observe Easter. But I think that this was a calculated strike so. against those who profess faith in Christ, in God, and His Word. Well, let's just be honest. We're living in a time when we have become, as a nation of people, anti-God, anti-Bible, and you well know, Don, the greatest ally the devil has is a closed Bible. That's right. And so, you know, when we talk about enacting laws so that 
people of the same sex can marriage. I think we've forgotten the Creator and what the Creator has said about marriage. It, it would seem to me that He would have the right to regulate uh, the dynamics of marriage. Absolutely. Now, before we get there, I want to go there in just a second, but when we're thinking about mm -hmm. uh, this concept that uh, they call it Transgender Day of Visibility, it's, it's an odd title to me, but sure. transgender, Many people might not even know what we're talking about when we say transgender, so I'd look this up to be sure we had it right. Transgender is a term used to describe people whose gender identity does not match the gender they were assigned at birth. It is an umbrella term that encompasses non-binary and gender queer people or people whose gender do not fall on the male-female spectrum. And so I got to thinking how many genders are there based on this definition? And so I looked this up, and what I found on medicine.net, they list 72 different genders. And I started reading through some of these. It is shocking. The first one is uh, agender or a gender. I'm not sure how they'd pronounce it. It's a person who doesn't identify themselves, uh, a person who does not identify themselves with or experience any gender. So they are genderless. Another one um, is a gender that is uh, unidentifiable. Uh, a lot of just really ambiguous things. Here's one, uh, number six on their list, is a gender they say is based on the person's mood swings or fluctuations. So your gender can change based on your mood swings. And it goes on and on 72 different genders. Is that what you find biblically? No. Matter of fact, I can't help but think about it in Genesis chapter 2 when God said after having created Adam, it's good that man should not live alone or it's not good that man should be alone. I'll make a help meet, a suitable companion, a partner. And God made the perfect complement for the man, which was a woman. A matter of fact, God took a rib out of the side of Adam and from that rib, he made a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam then said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken from the man. You remember when Jesus was asked about divorce in Matthew 19, mm -hmm. is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And Jesus answered that question with a question. He said, have you not read, he that made them at the beginning made them male yeah. and female. female. And so, based upon what the Bible says, there are only two possibilities in terms of gender, either a male or a female. Now, you know, when you talk about one thing that I've seen is when you have this discussion, people say, well, you don't really understand because there's a difference in sex and gender. And they'll say there's a biological sex, your biology, but your gender is what you feel or it's how you identify but we don't find that in the Bible either. No. How is gender defined in the Bible? Well, I was going to say, I, I had a conversation or actually overheard a conversation between two people, one uh, who identified as transgender, the other uh, who was actually a member of the church. And the person who was transgender said, look, I know all the verses. I know what the Bible has to say about it. But their response was, I have a sexual dysphoria. Well, I don't doubt that there may be some mental illness involved in this. As a matter of fact, I think that there probably is some mental illness involved. But biblically speaking, again, there's only male and female. That's uh, right. And from, from a biblical perspective, there is no such thing as gender identity separate from one's biological sex. No, no. And, uh, and I, remember, I, I remember back a year or two ago when uh, a lady was before Congress, and she was asked the question, can you define a female? And she deferred on that. And I remember thinking, you know, when I was in the first grade, when I was six years old, I could tell the difference between a male and a female, and I could define them. Yeah. It's interesting when you read the different roles assigned in the Bible, they are never based on a person's feelings or their emotions, or they can't identify it, and right. it changes you read about uh, a male child would be circumcised on the eighth day, Genesis 17, Leviticus chapter 12. That was based on his biology. Then he would be raised as a male. He would reach a certain point where he would become a, a son of the law, 
It was all based upon his uh, biology. That's the only basis and criteria that you read in the Bible. You know, Don, I was thinking about in Romans chapter 1 when the Apostle Paul indicts the Gentile world for sin. And you remember, one of the things that he talks about is the sexual perversion that occurred among those people on that day and time. And you remember couched within that context, he talked about how they changed the truth of God into a lie. And I think that that's what we're talking about now. You know, we're redefining terms that have been defined by the Creator. And we're not at liberty to change what God has already put into motion, if you please. And we've gotten down to the basic, uh, I mean, what could be more fundamental than the difference in a male and a female? And we're going to redefine that. We're going to reject even the most basic thing that, that, as you said, even a child can tell the difference yeah, in and, this. And, you know, if we go back to, to Romans chapter 1, three times in that context, the Bible says God gave them up. He gave them up to uncleanness, to vile passion, to a reprobate mind. And you remember in the days of, of Abraham and Lot, mm-hmm. God was going to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah because of the sinfulness of those people. And when the Bible says that Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom, and then by way of commentary, Moses said the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. Right. All right, jettison forward and look at 2 Peter chapter 2 when Peter, in discussing the judgment that would fall upon those who propagate false doctrine, he cited the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and how that God turned them into ashes, condemned them to destruction. And you remember he said, making them an example to all who would afterward live ungodliness, ungodly. And I think what we need to just step back and think for a moment about is the fact that if what Peter said by way of inspiration is true, that God judged those people because of their sexual immorality, then who's to say that we get a free pass as a nation of people? You know, what you're saying made me think of Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 49, talking about Sodom. Ezekiel says, look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. This is the sin of Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, abundance of idleness, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. I had someone on one occasion say to me, Sodom wasn't destroyed because of homosexuality. It says this was the sin of Sodom pride, fullness of food, abundance of idleness, and she didn't strength. So she's full of herself. She's wealthy. She's lazy. She doesn't care about others. That doesn't have to do with homosexuality. But then the next verse says, and she was haughty, and she committed abomination. Therefore, I took her away. I got to thinking about that, and Mm -hmm. I thought, you know, there's what you see there is a process. You don't have a an ungodly nation that became that way overnight. You're not godly one day and ungodly the next day. And so I think what you see is you've got a nation and they become prideful and then they're rich and then they've got idleness and free time and then they're in the sins around them and they couldn't be bothered as long as they're comfortable and then they tolerate it and then eventually they embrace it. And that's what's being described for us. And it gets to the point the Lord says, I've had enough and he takes them away. And then it made me stop and think, where are we as a nation? If you think about that as a process, have we been prideful? Are we wealthy? Do we have idleness? Have we gotten to the point that, uh, you know, we only care about ourselves? Have we embraced abomination? Now, somebody might say, well, you know, abomination, what's that talking about? Homosexuality is called an abomination. Sure is. And a, a... Leviticus Leviticus. chapter 20 and verse 13, if a man lies with a male as he would with a woman, they have both committed abomination. And so where are we? We have legalized homosexuality in this country. Yeah, I think, Don, the parallels are striking. And, you know, Isaiah said with regard to the people of his day, he said they parade their sin like Sodom. And if you go back, you know, just to maybe run down that, uh, that, that trail for a moment or two about what some were saying about, well, the real sin of Sodom, you know, yeah. like hosp- hospitality, et cetera. Well, you know, Peter said that, Rot, that Lot, and he identified him as a righteous man. He said he oppressed or vexed his righteous soul uh, because of the filthy conduct yeah. 
yeah. of the wicked. Yeah. Now, that same word, filthy there, is translated lewd mm -hmm. in Romans 13. Yeah. And, and so we're talking about a lifestyle here. Now, you know, somebody might be listening to this and they may think, uh, y'all are talking about homosexuality. That is not the same thing as transgender. We do understand those things are different. That's true. There are some similarities in That's them. True. But you know, a person that is transgender is one gender, and they've determined that they want to be another. They That's perceive true. themselves as another. They want to look as another. And I thought about this, the idea of a person who's a transvestite would be a person who would dress to be another gender, mm -hmm. uh, decorate themselves, portray themselves as another gender. And this passage occurred to me from Deuteronomy 22 and verse 5. The Bible says, a woman shall not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak, for whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. The Hebrew word translated as abomination refers to something the Lord finds as uh, repugnant and disgusting. Sure. And so the part that caught me was the idea of, of an abomination. I agree. If you've got a man who decides he's going to make himself up to be a, a woman, that's an abomination. It's a mm -hmm. sexual perversion. It's not right. It's not the way the Lord designed us. And with homosexuality, you've got a man whose desires are twisted. That's so true. there's similarity. We understand that there's a difference in these Yeah, I think two. so. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, when Paul talked about certain characteristics that would prohibit one from entering the kingdom of God, one of which was, of course, homosexuality, but also the idea of being effeminate. Yeah. And, and I think that that has to do, and you know, Don, the thought occurred to me that, you know, a person could undergo, quote unquote, sex change. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is that doesn't change the biological makeup, that DNA, that genetic code that is ingrained. Uh, it doesn't change that. No, it doesn't. You know, um, biblically speaking, I jotted down a few things before the program that we should keep in mind when we're approaching this. And number one, we've got to continue to stand on this principle and teach that it's wrong because the pressure is getting immense to cave on this, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, uh, Jesus said on one occasion, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. And so when we take a stand for what's right, and we talked about preaching and teaching the truth in love, as Paul talked about in Ephesians 4, but nonetheless, we still have to take a strong stand for truth. And, you know, Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, talked about how the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. Mm -hmm. So if we're not willing to take a stand for truth, then who will? Yeah, that's right. We can't compromise on this. We're talking about the most basic fundamental thing I thought about Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created them, male and female created he them. So we've got to keep teaching that this transgender movement is wrong. Secondly, if we're going to reach out and help people that are struggling with this type of thing, we need to seek to model proper gender roles Absolutely. as they're laid out in the Bible, based on the Bible. And um, when I say based on the Bible, what I mean is there could be some gender roles that are not right. And, you know, I've, I've always heard, you know, real men don't cry. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's not right. Jesus wept, that's shortest right. verse in the, the English Bible. So we need to teach gender roles according to the Bible. I think that's a great point to, to just set forth the roles that are defined clearly in Scripture. And as you said, you know, there are some characteristics and traits that are common to both sexes and maybe some that are more exclusive to the other. And, and you know, to understand that God created us equally, but also we're created differently. That's right. You know, there's a, a vast difference between a male and a female, and there are certain things that the female can do that I, as a male, will never be able to do. That's right. And they do it very well. Right. And I appreciate that. And in no way would I ever try to, to crowd that space. Yeah. Uh, a third thing that I thought about, when, when you see a, a transgender person, uh, we don't need to 
uh, react as, with a sense of disgust or disparaging remarks, uh, especially around our kids. We need to use that as an opportunity to teach them and to point out that it's sin, to talk about the reasons, but we do need to have some compassion. I think so. Uh, if we make disparaging, hateful remarks, uh, that's not going to help the cause of Christianity, is no, it? No. And you know, in Mark 1, when the leper who was a social outcast, uh, you remember he came to Jesus and the Bible says he knelt before him and he said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And the Bible says that Jesus was moved with compassion. Yeah. And I see that in John chapter 4 when Jesus is at Jacob's well in Sychar and he sits down with a woman that's been married five times. She's living with a guy. Now, you know, most, of, most people would say, you know what? I, I mean, that, that's a waste of time. But Jesus was willing to invest time in her because he saw behind her eyes a human soul or an eternal soul, I guess I should say. And, and so, as you said a minute ago, uh, we're talking about people that, that, that God loves them and we ought to love them yeah. and be concerned about them. You know, uh, Proverbs 14, 34, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. When we have the President of the United States making a statement like this, and I think about this, righteousness exalts a nation, sin's going to do the opposite. Makes me think we're in big trouble. He'll destroy it. Yeah. I mean, if I understand, matter of fact, again, going back to 2 Peter chapter 2, if I understand what Peter's saying, that, that those who engage in the sins of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, they serve as an example to all, A-L-L. In my mind, the president just put a big X on the back of America and said, you know, you know, come get us. Yeah. And that's a frightening thought. Yeah. And I mean, historically, look how God has used wicked nations to punish people when they get to the point that their cup of iniquity is full. Yeah. You know, it was said to Abraham in Genesis 15, you know, that, uh, you know, the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet full. Jesus used that same terminology in talking about the impending destruction that would fall upon the Jewish nation in Matthew 23, uh, that their day was coming. And so who's to say because we have been so richly blessed in this nation that, you know, and I think sometimes, you know, pride, uh, you, know, you know, when uh, the prophet in the long ago chided the Edomite people, one of their problems was they were, they were lifted up with, with pride. They thought that they were impregnable. Yeah. And God said, let me tell you what, I'll bring you down. Yeah, that's right. You know, it made me think again to Ezekiel 16, 50, after listing this progression of sin, the Lord said they were haughty, commit, committed abomination. Then the end of the verse says, therefore, I took them away as I saw good or as I saw fit. The Lord said, I watched this, I judged it. And when it got to that point and I thought enough is enough, that's where I drew the line. And it's concerning to think about the United States. And so I talk to even Christian friends, and they will say, uh, we've got to be preparing. And, and what they have in mind, some of them, is the idea that we need to be preppers and things of that nature. We need to be ready to fight. And mm -hmm. I say the best thing that we can do if we're going to change things, the most high rules in the kingdoms of men and, give us, and gives it to whomsoever he will. We see that back in Daniel chapter 4. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to change that. If we get to the point the nation is wicked and God has had enough, we're not going to change that. It's true. He will crush us. It won't matter how many F-22s we have, that all. we've got the greatest military in the world. It won't stand against God. The best hope that we can have righteousness exalts a nation, right. but sin is a reproach to any people. The best thing that we can do is to do what we're trying to do, and that is teach people the gospel. Without question. You know, to think that God was willing to spare the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah if they could find 10 righteous people. Right. And, and so, you know, there's something to be said about righteousness, a remnant of righteousness. And, you know, you go back to the prophet Habakkuk, and you remember he was concerned because, you know, the nation of Israel, Judah was wicked. You know, how could you allow that to go on God? And God said, let me tell you what, there's a nation to the north here. Mm -hmm. They're going to come down and they're going to clean your clock. That's right. And then, by the way, when, when they execute judgment on Judah, I'll judge them. And they'll be punished. That's, That's right. right. So, you know, we need to understand, as you said a minute ago, we're talking about a sovereign God. 
And it doesn't matter how much strength we possess militarily. If God says your time's up, it's up. Yeah. It, um, it makes you wonder when the cup of iniquity will be full for the United States. But the best hope that we have uh, is the gospel. Absolutely. Absolutely. Righteousness. People that have moral values have got to uh, exercise them. We need to speak. We need to teach. We need to so. pray. We need to vote for people that uh, will push these things and, and stand for what's right. Yeah, you know, if you look at First Timothy chapter 2, Paul, of course, writing under the, you know, you got Nero on the, on the throne, and yet he said to pray for kings and all who are in authority. We need to be praying right. for our nation's leaders. And then I think, as you said, we need to be preaching the gospel. What we need in this country, not necessarily more politicians, we need more preachers and teachers. That's right. That's right. That's the hope of America. Absolutely. Righteousness exalts a nation. Amen. So, Amen. Thank you, Mike. Thank it's you. always great to have you here with us. And hey, thank we're you. looking it's a, forward to listen, your, it's a your live program coming up soon. Thank so. you so much. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Truth on Wheels. Until the next episode, stay faithful.